Well, welcome to the DGM 301R lecture series on the audio industry. Today we have our guest is Fred Archambeau and Fred and I, I've known Fred hmm, how many years now? It's probably been, it's been a long long set of years. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's been 10 years. Like time does go by fairly quick. Yeah. I I bet it's been 10 years. Uh, I, I reached out to Fred the very first time uh, after actually city of evil was released and I sent you a message. I think it was on MySpace or something and you responded. And that was the first time that I corresponded with you, but we met in person at AES, uh, in LA. It was probably, it's been 10 years ago. Easy. Yeah. So, uh, and then we've just been having conversations back and forth and I've been out to his former studio and we filmed the interview out there. And then we had a, a student, who ended up going and interning with you for a while, Jared and yep. Jared's still doing, making noise and good three. So, and he said to say hi. So oh, awesome. great, pass great. that along. Cause he's like, I got to call Fred. I got to call him. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm due for a catch up with, with Jared for sure. Yeah, for sure. So Fred, um, why don't you tell us just right out the gate, what you're doing for a living right now, because what you're doing for a living right now might not be what people expect knowing if they've read your bio yeah yeah um that's a great point like currently um i am uh i'm the manager of music production for um uh, for warner brothers television um so warner brothers discovery uh wbd is the is the studio um and i work in the television department um and we're the largest producer of um producer in the world um, and so I overview every or oversee music production for all scripted uh, television series. So anything from like Game of Thrones, House of Dragons to Shrinking, um, trying to think of some other shows, um, Pretty Little Liars on the CW, um, a lot of the, obviously a lot of the CW content. Um, so I'm really in, um, you know, coming from a a long career in production and being in the studio and now on the business side, on the executive side of, of managing, um, our composers, our on-screen, uh, musical performances, um, dealing with, um, a lot of labor and and work related, um, guild issues, um, budgeting and, um, kind of risk management for the studio, um, and what that means. So, you know, trying to be that conduit between the creative folks, TV show producers, our, our composers, our creative executives, and um, the nuts and bolts of all the union contracts we have with SAG-AFTRA, which if you follow the news, we're in a, a SAG-AFTRA strike right now. Um, we are in a uh, one of the longest in history double strikes this, this industry has seen, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, has seen in a while and we just completed the writers strike uh, came to completion last week I believe so we have all our writing rooms starting back up for all our shows um but yeah right now I'm that that kind of that centralized person of service to our our execs our creative execs at least uh making sure that you know we're not in violation of any union stuff. It, it, it's a really kind of multifaceted job. I love it. It's 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 way different than some of the stuff I've done in the past, but the, some of the stuff I've done in the past has touched upon this. Like um, anytime I've done a, a major label record, you're you're dealing with union musicians, session musicians, um, uh, string dates. Like for the record that's behind you, the self-titled Avenge record, I had a, a big string date on that. And that was all union uh, musicians. Uh, and the and the union that is of concern is the AFM, so the American Federation of Musicians, and that extends to Canada as well, um, even though it's called the CFM, but it's basically the same uh, CBA, collective bargaining agreement that exists between the two guilds and the two countries. So anyways, long answer to, yeah, kind of transitioned into the music business side of, of, of my career, and it's I, I, that's something I really wanted to do. Um, and to be at a historic studio and again, the world largest producer of TV, it's, it's a great thing. And I oversee over a hundred shows. So, um, it's a volume business and, um, yeah, <laughs> so a volume business, you're a yeah. uh, hundred, a hundred different shows. So 
just i mean if you don't mind what what's a breakdown of a typical day like doing this yeah um typical day is kind of you kind of come in you see kind of what because obviously we have shows that are produced all over the world so i have shows and um there's a show for netflix that we produce called sweet tooth that is going into its third season um that's filmed in new zealand um, and that's a non-unionized show. So th that's a whole other thing. So I might have some things coming in later in the day from, from New Zealand. And I have a show called Sandman that um, I think it's completed its second season going into its third season. Um, and that is filmed and our composer lives in the UK. So you kind of come to the office and you might have uh, certain issues that have popped up um, that need addressing. Like, oh, I, I need to hire a choir. We need to make sure that that's in compliance with um, the musician union. This is the MU and, and the UK. Um, so kind of like dealing with some things in the email, uh, it, it, inevitably it's, it's about problem solving and, and getting people paid. Um, so um, anywhere from that to like dealing with the union claims that come in with meaning like a show like Shrinking would air on Apple TV and we used a bunch of licensed music you know, and, and they had a really big budget for licensed music. So they were using like, I think in the first episode, right from the gun, they used Billy Joel's uh, Piano Man. And so when you use something like that, uh, a licensed piece of music um, that's under contract, um, when that initial song was recorded by Billy Joel in the 70s, I believe it was in the 70s, uh, if not the 80s, that was done under an AFM contract for the musicians and the vocals that he sung were on a SAG after contract. And so they're a reuse uh, or what's called a conversion claim. And so those kind of claims kind of come in throughout the day and you have to kind of vet to make sure that we've used them and, and appropriately get them pay, um, get them budgeted against the show. Um, so it's, you kind of touch a lot of different things throughout the day. Um, and then obviously like, new shows that we have coming up like um i have a show um i think it's a dolly parton special that's uh for christmas um for 25 2025 but we'll start filming in 24 start budgeting some of the on-camera performances um, and like understanding from the script like break down the script okay what what are the musical performances that need to get done what does that look like how can we uh schedule that efficiently right like if i have eight different scenes that need pre-recorded um, things done, I'm not gonna do eight sessions. I'm gonna do one session that covers everything. Um, and so try to understand like, you know, consult, help composers and, and on cameras like consolidate their workflows. We're not spending tons of money with different sessions, um, which is a really different workflow than, than pop and rock music um, where, um, you know, underscore for shows kind of, get recorded in blocks. Whereas like, I, I feel like traditional pop music, like we just kind of work on a song, you know, until it's done. And then, um, whereas like a composer might like have bits and pieces that aren't completely done, but I'm gonna maximize the four hour session I have today and, and get as much music recorded. And it might be like bits and pieces of, you know, episode three and episode 16, like you have all these different things happening. How often are you getting to go into the studios to do that? Or are you staying where you're at? You know, I'm just kind of staying where I'm at. Um, on some special tentpole um, sessions, I might go out. Like, um, you know, we have some great composers that we work with. And uh, one gentleman, Blake Neely in general, uh, that we use a lot. He scored and won an Emmy for The Flight Attendant, which is a show that we produced. And then um, he did nine seasons of The Flash. And so for his... Um, series finale he had a big uh, 40 plus orchestra at the fox scoring lot and so we kind of go down to those kind of tentpole things and, and celebrate you know nine years of, of him composing great music uh, but not often just because like you, just so much stuff is needing to get handled uh day in and day out you know so yeah so let's talk about your uh your like where you started in this business and how you got to where you're at now. Um, I I know the past because I've talked to you about it before, but yeah, students might not know that. So uh, do you want to talk about starting in the studio with your band and then transitioning into your, you know, internship into your 
uh, working with mud rock and all that, and then how yeah. that landed you where you're at? Yeah, I think I, I think that the really the the thing that um, kind of ties it all together is understanding that, and I, and I would hope that everybody understands that every opportunity um, kind of leads to something else, or potentially can lead to something else. Um, and also, it's really important that I would urge the folks here and whomever is on this class and on my campus, like this industry, and it's not unique. Um, but this industry is very network driven. And that's a very nice way of saying it's who you know. Um, so you, right now your network are your fellow students that are taking the classes that you are, you know, the communities that you are, that's, that's your network. You have to start growing that. And so when I started, uh, I, I loved music from a very early age. It meant a lot to me, like probably everybody here. Um, so I went down the path of uh, loving the guitar and drums uh, and, and trying to, you know, be a musician. And um, and that kind of led me to a love of the recording studio. And so uh, really early on in, um, when I was in Boston and I was taking a class at Berkeley, um, it, I think it was like recording techniques for the musician. And it was like a 12 week, you know, course, but it, every week was a different topic. EQ compression. So you really never really got into the, you know, into the weeds as it were with any one topic, but it was a great, um, you know, uh, introduction to a lot of recording techniques that as a musician, you should at least be familiarized with, right? So um, as from there, that class uh, really showed me what, you know, studio stuff is kind of capable of, multi-tracking is capable of. And um, and so I started uh, interning at a studio in Boston and I just lucked out, you know, um, I, I this was like during the era of the yellow pages. And I, I just went through every recording studio in Boston and called them seeing if they wanted an intern. Uh, a couple did get back to me, but the one was called New Alliance Audio. And I met some great people there. And, and that's what harkens back to creating a network. The folks that I met during that initial internship and me hanging out and, and getting to know the folks in Boston, um, that initial network has has really gone on for me and has turned itself um, around, you know, the ROI on it has been great because these are people that I still um, am in touch with. We still kind of talk. Um, and, and they really enabled me to get other gigs, you know, so from, from my internship and, and uh, at New Alliance Studio, one, you learn a lot of techniques, right? And this was the, in the age of two inch tape, um, even one inch 16. Um, Pro Tools was starting to kind of come in and it was a real, at this level of studio, which wasn't a very high level studio, but it wasn't necessarily a bad studio. Um, and what I mean by that is the technology that was available. If I wanted to sync uh, as a MIDI sequencer, um, or at the time Pro Tools to a tape machine, it was through MIDI time clock, like printing SMPTE on tape and then trying to lock that to MIDI time clock MTC, which it was really difficult to get going, you know, and, and more elaborate studios have a better way of doing it um, via time code, um, um, whatever. So it, that was kind of my initial taste. So I learned how to like calibrate tape machines, clean cut tape, um, you know, obviously skills I don't use <laughs> uh, because we're all in the digital age. Um, but it was really, it was really important to understand like kind of where that went and, and to appreciate like the modern digital techniques that we don't really think twice about. And what I mean by that is if I wanted to record a reverse symbol hit, um, to crescendo at a certain point, like maybe introduce a chorus. Um, to do that on tape, you had to flip the tape. If it was on track two, it would be on track 23 uh, when you flip the tape. And then, you know, you'd have to time it out, reflip it, check it. Um, now it's like really quick. You, you probably just now just pop in a sample, but like, you know, to be able to kind of reverse something digitally now, it's so easy where back in the day, it was a technique, like you had to kind of have a little bit of chops. If I wanted to, you know, take 
a drum take, you know, say the drummer played three takes and I want to take take one of, you know, uh, the first half and take two of the bridge and take three of the chorus and put that and compilate it together. It was, it's very easy to do. Back then I was, you know, literally cutting tape and then, you know, pasting it back together and hopefully you got all the right bits back together. Um, so yeah, so from there it was, it was that, um, I, I briefly was asked to, um, play in a couple of different bands and tour a lot in my twenties. And then, um, uh, one band I was super proud of was Orbit that was signed to a &M Records. I did a little bit of touring with the Goo Dolls. Um, I did a lot of stuff with Blue Man Group as their live sound engineer in Boston and in Vegas and different television shows. Like um, they did some stuff with the Grammys and um, Regis and um, Kathy Lee, which was a talk show. I, I don't know if that show still exists, um, probably in a different format or different host, but um, yeah, so it was, you know, that initial internship really was was really fruitful. You know, there was a lot of great talent. Um, and um, and so obviously that studio was co-owned by Andrew Murdoch Mudrock. And he had, over the course of a weekend, recorded demos for a band that became Godsmack. And um, that became the first Godsmack record. So those were demos. Um, Sully, the singer in Godsmack, was in a speed metal band called Seika. And he was the drummer in the speed metal band. That band had a little bit of success, got signed. Um, I think they had to change their name because there was an adult film star named Seika and she wanted, you know, she had copyright claim to the name. So they had to rebrand that band. I, I think they were on MCA for a heartbeat. I could be wrong about that. But um, anyways, that band broke up. He decided he wanted to kind of front a band, like kind of pull a Dave Grohl and, uh, he had this band, you know, from uh, up on the border of New Hampshire and Boston, and he came in, he liked Andrew's production on Seika, he came in a weekend, has a, you know, and those, those, de that weekend of demos that I kind of worked on a little bit as an assistant, that became the first Gosmag record that went on to sell six, six million plus records. Um, so um, he had a lot of success, moved out to LA, um, and I kind of followed suit a few years after um, Orbit got dropped from AM Records. And uh, I really wanted to pursue um, a higher level of studio uh, production. And it, for me at the time, Boston had kind of had its heyday. Um, the 90s were really great for Boston. You know, uh, a lot of that, that kind of like um, indie rock stuff was super, super cool. And, and you know, even Radiohead went to Boston to do their first two records. Um, but for larger sounding polished records, it was New York or LA. Nashville still wasn't really a thing. And then London wasn't necessarily on my, my radar or places I wanted to live at the time. But um, so I came out to LA and um, worked at a studio called NRG Studios. And that was that was just the next level. Like you, you going into a, a multi-room uh, studio, they had three three studios, it's still in operation, uh, two Neve rooms and an SSL room. Um, it just operates on a different level, you know, um, just from the day, day in and day out operation of the studio to obviously the talent, the budgets uh, and the equipment. So um, that was very eye-opening. Like you really had to up your game at that point. It was no longer like, make it till you make it like you you're in it you're competing with the best of the best best engineers best producers um and um so i learned a lot through that uh met a lot of great people um but decided uh to kind of go at it as an independent engineer early early in my career and um and andrew and i had a pretty good working relationship he was staying busy um and we were working on some great records um you know, um, the early Chimera records for Roadrunner. Um, he was doing a lot of metal metal records. And um, we were doing an Alice Cooper record. And that's when we got a letter from uh, Larry Jacobson, the then manager of Avenged Sevenfold, wanting, uh, you know, somebody to kind of take this band under their, their, uh, under their wing, as it were. And, uh, and Andrew had, <laughs> Andrew was just so busy. He was like, I'm not interested, you know? And so I took a listen to the material and 
didn't quite understand it, but loved it. And um, it was really an opportunity for me to take a very small budget. I think at the time, uh, the record that became Wake in the Fall and was on for Hopeless, it was about $15,000. I, th I think I ended up spending a little bit more, probably like 19,000. But it, I think it's gone to sell uh, over over a million, if not 2 million copies. So I think the label had a good return on their investment on that one. Um, and so that that kind of like gave me the the impetus of, of being a record producer and, and um, kind of going down that road. So it's, yes, there's a clear evolution there, but um, as your career kind of develops, there can, there can be some ebb and flows. And from, uh, you know, producing records, I never thought of working in television, but I had produced a record that um, a couple of television executives loved. And this guy, Carson Daly, he's the host at MTV show, really loved. And, and then I became his, you know, director of audio and music production for about seven years. And so I did like, his late night television show for seven years. I did uh, the New Year's, the NBC New Year's Eve broadcasts for a couple of years. Um, so it just, there you go. It kind of, one thing leads to another, your network kind of grows. Um, yeah. So Carson Daly got you the taste of television. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and again, because we've talked a lot, I know you from Carson Daly, you kind of started doing some movie trailer stuff movie trailers yeah. wasn't very long but you you've now found yourself back into the television world um which speaks to number one something that's come up a lot in this lecture series is being versatile and yeah. and, and being able to take your skill set and and change it a little bit uh if you would have talked to yourself you know 15 years ago and said you're going to be this high level guy at warner brothers doing television would you have you believed yourself or would you have been like yeah right yeah i would have watched more tv i think um i uh yeah i i think to your point brian is um diversification i think is really key right now for success in the music industry and the modern music industry like and i was talking to someone else about this recently like um when i started out and was coming out of berkeley and early in my career it was very much like you were doing a lot of things, you're wearing a lot of different hats. Um, and then when I moved out to LA and, and was kind of at the top of the game making some big records, I didn't need to wear many different hats. I didn't need to have a schedule, right? Like I knew what I was doing for the next four years um, because I would do four records a year. Um, so you would know your thing, you'd be booked six to a year in advance. So like you just knew it. And then as the industry evolved or devolved, and digital and streaming and and all these things kind of came and and um, rightfully so kind of destroyed what what the industry was as far as plopping down twenty dollars for a record with one good song on it. Um, I found myself getting budgets shrinking. You know, like half a million dollar budgets became fifty thousand dollar budgets, fifty thousand dollar budgets became five thousand dollar budgets, but the amount of work increased, meaning like. Uh, not only were you engineering and producing it, you were mixing it as well. Now you're co-writing it. Now you're, you know, almost A&R A it as well um, and project managing it, of course. But um, so now I think I'm at a place in my career and what I think anyone who's going to succeed in the industry right now is what do you call it? You have to um, embrace the slash career aspect, meaning like, I look at myself as a television music executive slash I actually teach now at Berkeley online slash instructor slash I still play in orbit. I play in another play bass in another band with a lot of great musicians and like slash musician like you have to like kind of start wearing a lot of different hats and what that really is enabling you to do is you look at yourself as a business which you really do have to and how do you maximize income streams. You can have the active income streams from engineering and making records. Um, for me, it's like having this day job. Uh, I have passive income in my royalties and my songwriting royalties, my record royalties, my performance royalties. Um, being a musician, playing in a band, that's another form. Teaching is another form. Consulting. So um, I think that's diversification is the lifeblood, not only to survive, but to succeed. And um, you're going to have to 
be that kind of jack of all trades in this right now because I think you're you're just you're battling too much bandwidth um, for what's out there to be consumed as quote unquote entertainment. Right. Yeah. So when when you got your current job, which I know you haven't been there for a super long time, um, how much? Like or how prepared do you feel like you were for this position or how underprepared did you feel? Yeah, there's for, for a lot of this stuff, um, especially where I sit um, as kind of trying to be the, the union expert, there is no class or book that uh, teaches um, musician union law rules, regulations. And on top of that, everybody's, interpretation of the CBA or the MBA. So th those are terms that you should at least as a class be familiar with collective bargaining agreement, master bargaining agreements. Um, and the interpretation of that is, 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 is just that it's open to interpretation and, and us at Warner brothers might interpret it differently than those at Netflix and those at Paramount and those at NBC universal. So um, you kind of do have to, Put some critical thinking in so i was definitely not prepared for that i'm still learning and i have all this paperwork to actually go through right here behind me um regarding um some uh renegotiations that are happening uh, later in the fall but um yeah so you you kind of have to yeah i i felt underprepared i still feel underprepared but then you have to look at like okay well, what are the strengths i have what, what are the things in the last 20 years that i have that i can bring to the table no one in this department, or I'm going to say even on this lot, has the birth of experience of working with with artists that I do. Maybe there's a handful, but like I don't think anyone can say that they've worked with Avenged Sevenfold, Alice Cooper, and Tony Bennett, and you know contributed to a recorded produced element to that. Um, so I have to look at that and say, okay, I'm unique there. I can bring those experiences. And then on top of it, I never realized you have hard assets and you have soft assets. And throughout your career, you're gonna develop both. The hard assets are very easy to identify. The SM7 that's in front of you, the guitar hanging, the earphones, headphones, those are the hard assets that you collect in your career. You know, um, But the soft assets, you don't necessarily put value. And that's what I would urge you to start putting value to. Soft assets are, who's in your Rolodex? Who can you call today if you need to get something done, right? Like, um, even as simple or stupid as like, there's a show at the Hollywood Bowl, Incubus is playing, I want to go, it's sold out. Well, who do you know in your contacts that could get you a guest list plus one or whatever, right? Um, or um, I have a composer that's not giving me the paperwork. Who do I know or how do I know him or who in my Rolodex can I like talk to so that I can get what I need out of him? Um, so those are the soft assets. And the other thing I looked at in my career that helped me translate to this was I never realized I was a project manager for 20 years. That's what recording, like producing a record is. It's project management. Like you have a, a date, you have a budget, and you have things that need to get done. Now, whether you formalize that through a Gantt chart or through Excel or Smartsheet or anything, or however you keep track of it, but at the end of the day, you are a project manager. Um, so I would urge anybody here to look into the tools that traditional corporate project managers use and how you can uh, simulate that into a creative uh, document and workflow that works for you. Um, because at the end of the day, you might have a lot of different projects going on and you also are waiting Let's say you have four projects going on and they're all in different statuses and you're waiting for your completion payment, your commencement payment. Like, how do you keep track of it? And what you don't want to deliver something and you haven't gotten paid on. Right. And you're like, oh, gosh, I lost track of where I was with things. So that's the other important thing with um, like taking those soft assets and learning what they are and looking at them. So that's that's kind of what I've done. I've looked back in my 20 years and I've I've repackaged what I've had and like brought it to more of a corporate side of things. It's like, I have project management, I have budgeting, I do have some union knowledge and I do have a network of folks that I can reach into um, that, you know, maybe you don't have, right? So I add value there as well. Right. And also on top of it, I add insight into, because I know what it's like to be 
someone who's mixing uh, a trailer or mixing a record. And so when I get an invoice from an engineer, I can call it out and be like, I think that's a little bit high, you know, or that's on point, or, you know, I can look at these budgets and really understand what goes into it. Um, and also like when we work with artists, um, I really do understand that work that goes into it and what needs to get translated. For instance, um, we have um, a series, I can talk about an old series. I can't talk about what's what's currently on my plate, but uh, there was a series called Call Me Cat and we had the bass player from 30 Seconds to Mars, right? The, the band, Jared Leto's band, mm -hmm. uh, produce a song for us. And so I had to put them on an AFM contract and that AFM contract is very much formalized. It's very much for like the traditional orchestrations and the traditional like string sessions and having a contractor. And so when you try to put a pop musician into that type of contract, it's very hard, but I understood exactly the work that he was doing, the hours that he did, the instrumentation. And I was able to kind of help, you know, interpret that contract for him to work so that we're compliant with our union he gets paid what he needs to get paid and we you know go about our day right yeah. so um so in that regard i felt very prepared and then the other part you just you just you have to be willing to fail and learn uh, which is hard to do later in your career but uh you're not going to be great like the first time you sit down and mix a record or mix a song i i, I doubt anyone's great at it you know and if you are like God bless you. <laughs> well, we, we, what I'm hearing and this, and I have a different perspective from the students though, but this record right up here was kind of your biggest budget, if I remember correctly. Um, and you, you acted with the band as producer, but I believe you were financially in charge of this album. Is that correct? Yeah, in a way, like um, I helped budget that one together. Uh, the band ended up producing that uh, themselves. But yeah, I definitely had a hand into where we kind of spent the money on that and um, and how much we spent of it. Um, so being mindful of stuff, I think, um, you know, understanding what kind of gets charged and what, like here, here's a great story about project management and budgets. Um, I was working on, the record prior to that, which was City of Evil, which was uh, their first Warner Brothers record. And I think there was a lot of eyes on that record. Um, you know, it was a new signing. It was a pretty high dollar signing. You know, they had a lot of heat on it. Um, anyway, so we um, had tracked drums at uh, a studio in Hollywood called um, Ocean, which is now called United. It's on, uh, I think it's on Hollywood and Gower or Sunset and Gower. A really iconic studio, um, one of the best drum rooms in the world, Studio B. And so we did drums with Jimmy the Rev there for about a week. And we had um, brought in our own Pro Tools systems and our own wiring harnesses that were called Elko 90s, uh, which is, a, you know, wired to harp standard, which is all like kind of a technical way of how you pin an Elko. Um, so we were responsible for that aspect of it, but we also decided to use their tape machines, which we thought was very much a sound associated with, with that studio. They had these old, um, I believe they were Ampex 124s, they're, they're called the washing machine, um, because they look like a big white washing machine, and they're really, I never trusted myself on them, I would let the assistant because like to punch in on it, it wasn't like a Studer or an MCI that was very fast to punch in. Like when you punch in on a Studer, like it's great. Like it's really responsive. Like when you punch in, it goes into record. When you punch out, it goes in, it goes out. So you, you were very much, um, your actions translated to the tape. The Ampex machines that they must've been from the sixties or something. Um, you had to, if you wanted to punch in on the one, you had to punch in on the, the, the last 16th note of bar four, of beat four. Like you had to anticipate the punch and then you had to anticipate the punch out because it it had lag and I didn't know the lag. So um, I would always let the um, the assistants who knew those tape machines, like I'm not going to punch in on this, you do it. Because <laughs> they knew how to anticipate the punch in. Um, so we used the tape machine. So um, 
And when we were doing it, I was recording to both systems at the same time through a mold. So I would record to Pro Tools and to the tape, and I would do all these takes. And then once we, let's say we had four takes of a certain song done, I would go back and transfer off the repro head and get that tape compression back into Pro Tools. And so what I ended up with in Pro Tools, if you can imagine this playlist, you would have your four takes that were live done digitally. And then I would have four analog repro compressed uh, versions as well. So I would have eight versions. And what we learned that the band liked was they liked the drum performances, the verse and the choruses, the, the groove parts, we liked the sound of tape. But for all the drum fills, we liked the sound of digital because it was a little bit brighter and crisper and those moments kind of jumped out a little bit and had some definition to what Jimmy was playing. And that record had a lot of fast tempos and a lot of, it was just a lot of a lot, right? So everybody was playing a lot of stuff and the tempos were very fast. So you had to have some definition to kind of hold that together. And so at the end of the day, I would comp together all these things and I would have one master take over the four different or eight different elements, four different performances. And so you could imagine like one master take would have like, you know, verse here. It was just this, you know, very much a patchwork uh, a performance that was put together. And fast forward to the end of the record, I was prepping the record to get mixed by um, Andy Wallace and I was kind of layering in some drum samples and I was really zooming in to the sample level of Jimmy's performance. And I was noticing the phase of the kick drum and the snare drum getting reversed. And, and I, I was like, that doesn't make sense. And so kind of did some back uh, detective work. And I realized that the tape machine and Pro Tools were out of phase. And I then I thought to myself, well, if everything is in phase, but the polarity is shifting from verse to fill to chorus. Does it really matter? Because at the end of the day, everything's in phase. And then we decided, well, at the end of the day, the verse, the kick drum is positive. So it's pushing the speaker towards you. And then during the fills or transition parts of songs, the kick drum and the speaker is actually sucking away from you. And so I think we wanted to correct that. So we went in there and we corrected everything. And it was pretty laborious. And on top of that, it was, we are also due for a string session at the same studio, Studio B at, Ch at Ocean Way. And I only needed one day. And for some reason, somebody booked us two days and we were gonna be over budget by quite a bit of money for two days of studio time that we didn't need. So we called the studio and said, hey, we don't need, we don't need two days. I only need one day. They say, well, you're on the books for it. Like, sorry. And at the end of the day, that money comes out of your producer advance. So it's not like, oh, the record's going to give you an additional $5,000 or $7,000. No, you're going to get paid less. You're going to get paid less $5,000, less $7,000. So I made the call to the studio and I said, listen, we've had this issue with the, the tape. I really think your tape machine is out of phase. And they said, absolutely not. Um, you brought your Pro Tools system with your own wiring harnesses. Your wiring harnesses are out of phase. I said, I'll tell you what, have your tech run a phase check on the repro head and the sync head of your tape machine. And if you find that the repro head and the, uh, the sync head are out of phase, I will pay for the extra day that I don't need. But if you do find the issue, you're going to give me the day back. And I don't, I'm not going to pay you another $7,000. I said, you're on. Like, that's a bet we're willing to take. And I said, okay, cool. And uh, a few days later, I got a call. And like, yeah, our repro head was out of phase with our, our, our sync head. Um, so I don't know what that story tells. Oh, it's, uh, you know, a little bit of project management and budget and, um, and just being top of your stuff, you know. So. Right. Well, it also shows that you, you know, you have to be willing to negotiate things that might otherwise hurt your budget, right? It might hurt your your bottom and, line, and not my, hurt my budget, but I mean, hurt hurt my pay, man. Right. Like, you know, now you're messing with my money, right? And and that and that record, as as um, you know, um, 
I think we spent a quarter of a million dollars on it, but that's a lot of money. But at the end of the day, when you look at all the costs associated with it, it was it was a very, you know, threadbare record to make, you know. Um, I, I think now in this day and age, that that's quite uh, um, a lot. But back then when you were dealing with with tape costs and studio costs and that kind of thing, it, it was, um, we were, we were cutting it close. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, yes, we were, we were, we were getting paid, but it wasn't like uh, we were swimming in it. Yeah, no, that I I think it's a good lesson. There's a lot to be you know pulled from that, and we'll let the students extrapolate other ideas out of that as needed because um, that's you know that's some of the benefit of having these. And I think at the end of the day, that and that's if anything you could pull from that, like being a producer and being at the helm, you have to be the leader of it. You have to uh, really shoulder a lot of it. But like right there, like you can go so. Like I was dealing with the polarity of a sink head versus a repro head. Like that's how in the weeds I was getting. So as a record producer, you can go in the weeds like that, but you also have to be so high level to understand, okay, lyrically, how will this lyric age in 10 years, right? Like philosophically, sometimes you have to have that that Rick Rubin like experience and 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 um, vision of like not getting sucked into the weeds. You know, Rick is not an engineer who's who probably even knows what the polarity of a repro head versus a sync head is. He, he, nor does he care. But that's the thing that I want folks to understand how multifaceted it is from budgeting, project management, the political thing, the um, the artistic, you know lyric side of things to the nuts and bolts of, of the technical things. And you can align yourself in any of those verticals to really have success. Like a producer like Terry Date, who meant a lot to me, probably in this day and age, probably none of you guys really know or care who he is, but like he He's was very me. much an uh, a engineer type guy who became a producer. Was he somebody that's going to work with your lyrics and and offer like, hey, let me rewrite that bridge for you and pick up a guitar? No, but man, could he get a great drum and guitar sound for Pantera, right? And then maybe that's exactly what that band needed. So there's a lot of ways, a lot of like you can be a singer songwriter producer or songwriter producer, or you can be a mixer producer, you can be an engineer producer, you can be uh, like Rick Rubin, very much a vibe guy who just comes in and like creates the vibe that's necessary. And so for me, I've always tried to pull from all those different folks that I love. Like I love Terry Day. I love um, Bruce Fairbain was a, one of my favorite, favorite record producers, Canadian producer who did like some Aerosmith stuff, some later Aerosmith stuff, Pump and um, Get a Grip. And then he did like Razor's Edge, ACDC and some Bon Jovi. He kind of came from that like Vancouver. The studio was called Big Mountain. Do a little bit of research on Big Mountain. There's a great, that's where Metallica Black record, they did vocals. Um, that's where um, Bon Jovi did a lot of his early stuff, like Suburban Wet. Um, there's very much a sound associated with the Bob Rock, Bruce Fairbain. Um, and there's another name of the gentleman I'm missing, but um, th there was a whole camp of guys out of that, that era that made, I love the sound of those records. And so I would pull from that, you know, um, as much as I could and uh, and just try to make it my own, you know, so. Right. Yeah, no, I, you, you've covered some, I didn't have to ask the question because you covered it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's, uh, if, if we're going to talk about some of the other lessons you've learned along the way, what are some lessons in like hard knocks or, or, or things that you've had to really, you said, you know, earlier about failure, but what are some of the things that you've learned out of failures along your journey? Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing that you kind of come, there's two things that kind of come to learn um, out of this. And I think this is, I was told this and it, it never really stuck with me until much later. We're in a service industry. And, and if, let's say if we're talking in specific to being a recording engineer, a mixer, a record producer, like let's talk about those three instances, you know, or, or combination thereof. There is nothing, and I mean this, nothing different from what that is and what you do than a waiter or a cook. You're of service to the artist, to the song, 
a cook or a waiter is to service of a meal to a customer. And what I mean by that, if that customer wants, let's say you work at a great high-end steakhouse and your personal philosophy is, you know, a steak should be cooked medium rare and never have any type of ketchup, no kind of seasoning other than salt and pepper. Um, but if that customer wants it burnt to a crisp with ketchup and A1, you deliver that. And that is your job. You're not there to impose. Uh, now, of course, if you are being asked for your opinion and, and you are in the room as more of a tastemaker, yeah, you're going to try to steer steer what you think is, is the correct thing. But even then, you have to do it in the guise of what plays in the marketplace. And that's the other thing, too, is learning that what your tastes are doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for the artist or work for the market. You have to understand that you're producing a product that's going to try to fit into a certain something, right? Uh, and you have to identify what that certain something is, what the audience and the numbers are, and then hopefully you're spending accordingly, right? Um, so to be of service, and I think Jimmy Iovine has has made a career of saying that, you know, is how to be of service to the artist. So I think that's the main takeaway early on that I tried to probably put too much of my personal taste into things and 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 have a um, I don't know have a judgment, you know. And I think at the end of the day, it's like, well, who am I to judge if that's really what it is? And try to understand where the artist is coming from and the and, and the market and the audience that we're trying to serve. Um, so that was super important. Um, gosh, I mean, there, there, there's so many, and I think don't ever undervalue your time, but also understand that, um, sometimes not doing something for a paycheck might pay off, you know, in different ways. Right. So it can't always be about like the bottom line. You really have to weigh like, well, what is this going to lead to? This might lead to a long-term relationship. This might lead to a larger network. This might lead to more consistent work. Um, th and that's hard to kind of, you kind of have to do case by case, but always kind of keeping that in my mind uh, was kind of hard to do. Um, you know, the other thing too is like, you're not gonna have all the answers, you know? Um, you always, and I always felt like you had to have the answers. I always felt like too, like if something sounded not right or bad, I always thought it was my fault. I was like, well, no, it can't be right. And so case in point is like, you can have like, and I had a lot of this stuff. I still kind of do. Like I had the whole setup, guitar, pedals, cables, microphones, amps, cabinets. Like that was the sound of Brian and, and Avenged, right? And then you get another guitar player, same setup, and it sounds kind of like dog shit. And, and it's like, well, it's not my fault. It's in the player's hands. And so learning what is your responsibility and what is you kind of have to relinquish is super important, right? Like, um, and also to understand, like, you know, if... <laughs> A guitar player is like struggling with a part they're going to say oh the sound isn't right it's like well no you're just not you know knowing when when an artist is giving an excuse and when not um and that, that's super important and that's you know trial and error to learn um but yeah I, I think that's what comes to mind is like i always felt like i was shouldering way too much and it's like oh it's not really my i can't you know right yeah so you mean I, if I just went back through your studio, hooked everything back up the way it was, I wouldn't sound exactly like Brian. No, you know, and that's and um, no. <laughs> and if you guys don't know who Brian is, that's the lead guitar player of uh, Avenged Sevenfold, goes by Sinister Gate. Some of you guys know him as that. Um, <laughs> he, nobody's gonna sound like him. No, he has a, he has a very particular right hand. You know, um, and I think that's what makes it sound good. Not the left hand, the right hand. Yeah. I mean, he's a right hand guitar player, so it's the picking hand. I think. Right. So, same yeah. thing with James Hetfield. Like it's it's all in the in the right hand. Yeah, yeah, and that's great. Um, great information. Uh, as you've progressed through your career, like the next you know five ten years, what do you see staying the same, or what do you see changing in your career? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I was. Uh, you know, working with somebody recently about and something that I've, I've kind of um, 
concentrating on. I think, you know, for me, uh, when I left college, I, I never finished and I, I left to go uh, play with the Goo Goo Dolls basically for two years on a world tour. And um, so I left college behind and just about three weeks ago, I finally finished my degree and, and graduated. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm super stoked on that. And uh, it means a lot to me because now it's opened up a lot more opportunities for me. And so one, it's led me to this opportunity to teach at the school that I went to, obviously. Um, and then um, I might pursue a master's degree. And what I really want to focus on is um, how to basically take the music business, what I know of it, and 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 really kind of get to the next echelon of um music executive really you know I, I i i think i do like the marriage of a visual and audio um i would love to stay in this lane um but i'm also trying to create um a vast area of knowledge and leadership skills that would afford me a lot of different opportunities if i see them happening you know my ultimate dream of has always and will be to be an an a guy at a, at a cool label. I, I don't want to say a major label, but at least a, a label where um, is cool. I, I, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get to that, but I would like to go down the road of, I do like being on the business side of stuff now. Um, um, I might dabble again with production here and there. Um, never say never, but uh, I do like, I, I, I like being of service to artists. I feel like I have enough like experience, um, you know, in management as well, you know, I would, I would manage artists or manage producers or engineers. So I'm just trying to like, um, learn as much as I possibly can and, and, um, kind of continue the growth of, of being on this side of, of the business of it. You know, um, it, it's still, it's still exciting. It's just a different, you know, Hey, it, it's getting artists paid. It's, that, that's good. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really good. Getting working musicians paid. It's great. You know, um, and there's a lot of great, cool history that I get to touch upon, especially when it comes to uh, older music that getting used in newer TV shows. If you look at those those session reports and you see like where these songs were recorded, who played on them, you know, and and um, a lot of these folks are no longer with us. So making sure that their beneficiaries are getting paid, you know, that's super important to me as well. Yeah. So um, with some of that paperwork behind you, is that, how you're having to spend some of the day like actually doing that research or does that come to you in a report from somebody else i have a couple of assistants that do a little bit of, of the research but this paperwork behind me is uh a lot of paperwork is more um we're going into uh um the afm is going into a renegotiation of their contract their cba so i'm looking at some legal documents from 2019 and some of the issues that maybe weren't resolved uh, with the CBA back then. Um, but yeah, I do. I definitely have a lot of a lot of support. I, I have two assistants that are remote that um, help kind of you know do a lot of the the, the nitty gritty stuff. But um, yeah, just signing signing off on that stuff. Yeah, nice. Well, um, um, let me turn the time over to my students here because uh, I'm sure they have questions. So we'll turn the next little bit. Yep, hands went up instantaneously. Turn the turn the time over to their questions for a few minutes. And before we uh, sign out, um, the, the students might not know this. And Fred, you uh, you know graciously agreed a couple of years ago to to be on our academic board of advisors here at the university. It doesn't mean a whole lot right now because we the COVID thing put a huge wrench in in um, that, but. As we finish up our, we've written a new curriculum for our stuff. We'll be actually sending that over to you. You don't have to do it obviously yeah. today, but um, want you guys as you students to know that we do run what you guys are learning by people like Fred. You can tell he's very well versed in what's going on in this industry. And so that's important for me as your guys' professor to make sure that the information that I give to you guys is to a level and standard that will get you guys hired when you get out of here. So I want to just say really quick, thank you for, you know, being willing okay. to do that because that's, that's a big deal for us. Nice. So, all right, John, let's turn it over to you. You got a question. Yeah. Hi, Fred. 
Um, so my question is, uh, what is some project management uh, knowledge you wish you had like 20 years ago? It's like, ah, uh, like that would have really helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I wish I had the knowledge of um, really putting structure to my projects and records. And what I mean by that is, I don't think at the time, 20 years ago, this existed, but I could have created this in Excel and that's the use of what's called a Gantt chart. And I don't know how hip you guys are to Gantt chart, but that was, uh, Gantt charts were created by this guy and it's a project management tool of like setting a timeline. So meaning like I have to deliver this record, let's say August 10th. And then you work back of all the different milestones that have to get accomplished. So like, are the songs written? Are the songs pre-produced? Have we arranged them? You know, drums. You kind of go through all the milestones that you you don't necessarily like formalize and give in your head. And I would have probably have done that where I would have formalized everything and, and then worked my way back. So I knew I was hitting certain milestones and I had a critical timeline to know that I was delivering on time and hopefully I was delivering on budget. And I think when you don't give that specific structure to it, you kind of kind of and then that's the creative process right like i think we're all creative here so it's like you don't necessarily want to assign that type of work but i wish i had given some formalization to that and that way if i were to do it today i would do it through a platform called smartsheet and i would encourage you guys to check it out because you could create these project trackers with email notifications meaning like um if I missed a due date on something, it would email me and said, you forgot to do this. And maybe that was like sign my deal memo or a uh, follow up on an invoice. And it would also like, as I was putting up rough mixes or finalized mixes, you could automate that to send to your manager or the band's manager and they would help track your back end payments as well. So I, I I would probably wish that I had a little more formalization of, as opposed to just having a whiteboard with certain milestones. I would have, I wish I had something that was more collaborative, more centralized, uh, a centralized place that I was uploading all my daily mixes, my rough mixes, um, and Smartsheet would would do that, you know, or Google Drive, or whatever it is that you you like to use. I would really lean into that suite of tools in order to kind of like be able to kind of look at it and then also like share that. Like, you know, I worked for many years with a manager and that person, like she could have looked at it and and helped keep me on track too, of like, oh, this needs to get done. And of course, at the end of the day, like, you know, you're working on multiple records. So now you're going to have multiple things. You know, you're going to have, instead of 15 songs to work on, you might be working on 60 songs through the course of a few months. So um, I, I wish I, had, yeah, Excel, um, charted that stuff out a little bit. Thanks so much. And just to clarify, when you say formalize, uh, you don't mean like a full blown like critical path analysis or something. You just mean getting it down. Yeah, I, I, I mean, okay. look, a critical path analysis would be great, but I think that might be a little bit of a waste of time unless that comes super second you know, um, nature to you. But at least just having the milestones down and some sort of due dates down. Um, and again, like, because right now we're so collaborative and remote to have some sort of centralized platform like Google Drive uh, or Smartsheet where everything lies and it's, and it's accessible because it's web-based, it's cloud-based, um, that makes it so easy. And on top of it too, like you could lock files, meaning like if I haven't been paid for a final mix, I will upload the MP3, but I will lock the uh, wave file, right? I'll password protect the wave file, and not give that person the, the password until I know one, my PO has been issued or two, my check's been issued. And then once my check's been issued, I'll give you the password. And then that way you can go to mastering, you know? Um, never, you never wanna give up your assets until you get paid. Like that's the only thing you can hold on to, whether it's the hard drive or whatever. It's like, I'm gonna hold on to this until you guys settle up with me. Um, so, yeah. Awesome information. Anybody else have any questions? I mean, I've got lots of questions we can ask them, but what this is for you guys. I mean, you're you're talking with uh, somebody who's now at a television studio, who's you know been producer and 
worked on many, many uh, things. You I guys worked on this seen. movie, which is my favorite movie. If everyone hasn't seen Tar, please go see it. That's such a, it's like the funniest movie, even though it's like the darkest thing too. The first scene is so funny of her like talking to this uh, composer group at Juilliard. It's like the funniest scene. I was the only one laughing when I was at NBC Universal. I was like, this is funny. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? Because it's so inside music, you know. So yeah. Um maybe you got a question we'll let's go ahead and turn it over to you hi fred nice to meet you um so i think you're talking a lot about your studio work um i'm working with a band right now and i kind of want to get what's your best take on like drum recording for the studio um in general just set up and then processing because i feel like that's one of the trickiest parts to get right in the analog world is um, drums for sure where tell me more about the space you're recording drums uh, here at the UVU studio, so I'm not sure if you've seen it or Brian's shown you at all, but it's got a fairly large uh, open room with some curtains that can be pulled around uh-huh. with a DW and so, kit. What, and then what? what's the end result you're going for? Big bombastic, tight 70s? Um, it's a little bit shoegazy and like garage rock, so kind of big snare, um, but yeah. still kind of wide and yeah, tight. so kind of washy, but you definitely want to yeah. hear the ambience yeah. and stuff. Yeah, so I think, um, I think the most important thing in that type of element, like I always think of like records, like I think of when you think of shoegazery, I think of like um, my bloody Valentine, Loveless, like that record, um, very much kind of defined shoegazing. Uh, rock you know the early 90s but I think the most time spent on room mic placement and getting as much of a picture of the drum kit as you would like it to hear in the room Uh, so I would really concentrate like if you were sitting down getting sounds right and you had your drummer play like I would have the drummer play at like 75 percent of effort or 80% of effort. So you just know kind of where to gain stage things, right? Because you know they'll dig in a little bit harder once they start actually doing takes. Um, but I would, instead of like kicking, like pulling up the kick drum sound and really listening to that isolated, I would I would just start with the room mics. I would start with probably, and I would probably have a couple different sets of room mics. I would probably have something, you know, high up, depending on the room, you know, you would, that's the thing too is like, okay, but that's where I think the most time uh, is worth it. It's like, do the room mic sound good in the corner facing a, opposite of the drums? Putting something in front of the room mic so that you're not getting direct cymbal bleed. You're, you're adding some distance artificially by putting a gobo or whatever your packing blanket in front of that microphone. And maybe having a couple different sets of, of, of drum mics. So I would do it something like, if I was doing something shoegazery, I would do something very extreme and like be really heavy handed with compression and just get that room to pump and like almost to the point where like the compression's like making the drum sound reverse, like just super vibey, like, um, I, you know, I'm trying to think of uh, <laughs> the name of the dude, but anyway, like, it's just like, I, I would go for a vibe, right? And you might not be the right vibe, but like, just go for it where it's like, everyone at the time oh that sounds really cool and then I would start working the instruments behind it meaning the kick and the snare so that it adds definition but I would also do a little safety and I would do a a mid set of rooms and don't mess with them right because what if you got it all wrong right therefore you have something later uh to mess with and to in post like fuck with but if you could really go for it on the way into Pro Tools with these two room mics that are like the vibe ones, go for it. And then do something that's just not touched. Um, and I think probably that that room, probably there's a buildup of about 300 to 500 Hertz. So I would, I would start notching some of that stuff out. There's probably some low mid stuff there that that's kind of ugly that you kind of want to uh, start sucking out right away. Um, um, and then I would also, I would always do what's called a butt mic. And that's like a, a lo-fi, if there's a harmonica microphone or um, do something like behind the drummer, like kick snare vibe that's like crunchy and distorted. So I always used a, um, there's a company called Copper Microphones that makes it, um, but 
there's also the Shure Bullet Mic, which is a green microphone that harmonica players use, and it has a quarter inch, so it actually goes into a guitar amp or some type of amp. You could do that too. Like you could go bullet mic, like literally behind the drummer's butt. So you're kind of hearing kick and snare, you know, with the body of the drummer kind of blocking cymbals. And you can either go into a DI straight into Pro Tools and then maybe put an amp simulator on it, like Sans amp or something. Or if you really want to get creative, run that bullet mic to a small combo amp with like maybe a tube screamer and then mic the combo amp. And that becomes your your super saturated sound. And then you're obviously gonna have to play with the phase to make sure the phase is right of that little affected thing with the rest of the drum kit. But when you sync that thing in, it's oh it's so cool. And it's like that's like that super crunchy kind of it, it kind of would make it kind of white stripey meets like you know shoegazery. And it could just be like those two things with a little kick and snare might just be your vibe. You might not even need overheads, right? Because your room mic is going to have plenty of overheads. So Okay, thank you. That was super awesome. Crazy ideas that I'd never thought of. So appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like, I would always reserve um, one channel or stare. Yeah, yeah, I would always reserve one channel of something that's just stupid, whether it's like putting a microphone um, in a trash can and the trash can is uh, in front of the kick drum. I also did a floor tom that was super resonating in front of the drum kit and I would mic that floor tom and compress the shit out of it. And so you would hear this resonating, um, and hopefully it's in key, resonating thing. And so, yeah, I would always like experiment one thing because at the end of the day, it's like, oh, if it doesn't work, you just, you just trash it, no one knows the difference. Um, but I would always reserve one channel to do some sort of an experiment. And through those experiments, you'd find the things that kind of work for you. And then those are the things that like the bands and the artists remember like, oh, he did this really cool thing. And that kind of becomes your signature um, that no one else does, right? Because it was the, it's your own recipe that you made up. Um, but I think it's worth th that time to put a little bit of left of center sound to something because anybody can throw a clean sample and make it punchy. But like, if you can bring that character, especially that genre you're talking about, it's about um, capturing the, it's not about capturing the drum. Anyone can do that. It's about capturing the space around the drum in a cool way. And that's one thing that Fred has taught me like through our years. Um, when I did my master's thesis, I had Fred answer a bunch of questions. And that was one of the really key important things is to look at the drum kit as one instrument, not a series of individual instruments, and then piece it together uh, as as one which was a completely different approach than what I had been used to. So, but it's a really good question, Will. Um, John's got another question, so let's shoot it back to you, John. Yeah, so um, second question is, uh, how do you um, decide like what music, like how do you find music for, you know, the TV shows that you're assigned? Like, are you pouring through ASCAP libraries? Like, are you just looking for weird stuff on Instagram? Like, how do you find stuff? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, that's going to really default to uh, a few more creative folks than me. But I, I can talk. I can talk about the process of it, and that's going to be very like, it's so specific, right? So, like, if you have a show, um, for instance, we have a show in development that takes place in the '70s in Maryland. Well, obviously, you have to stay with music pre-1970, right? So, right there, it it limits you, and then what kind of character is it? And and so um, a lot of what's in the script and on the screen informs the right vibe. Um, so from a, a licensed song point of view, that's what's going to get the syncs is, is really what is in line with the story, the characters, and, um, and what the budget is. So obviously, even at some of these bigger shows, like you have X amount of dollars or clearing uh, pre-existing master recordings, right? Like uh, songs that we know, like a Taylor Swift song or, or all that stuff. And, and when you start to put those big songs into TV shows, it eats up your budget, right? So like you might go and play for like, oh, I really want this Rolling Stone song. And you'll pay through the nose to get the Rolling Stone song, which leaves you $5,000 to, to put the rest of the music in. And so you're going to go into libraries. And so there's libraries like Extreme Music, APM, Five Alarm. Uh, those are the three that kind of come to mind, but you can look at them and 
um, those are music libraries that are really cheap songs made by active songwriters that just put their songs in there. And so there's what's called a blanket license that most studios or shows will pay, meaning like we'll pay X amount of dollars for this series to Five Alarm Music and we can use whatever we want from them, right? So it really covers our ass if we spent 100 grand on Led Zeppelin and we have nothing left. Um, so as far as the licensed music, um, those are some of the couple things that are coming into play. As far as composing uh, underscore music, um, that's going to be like, we want very specific things, meaning like a show like Sandman, we wanted a very large, um, lush orchestration. We went with a composer that specializes in that, David Buckley, who's an English composer that just has that big orchestra sound, right? Whereas certain other shows might want that more industrial grimy thing and they might turn to a Trent Reznor or Atticus Ross. And if Atticus Ross isn't available, maybe they'll go to the next person in line. Like who's the next Atticus Ross that does weird tension-y sound effect-y underscore. Um, Sherry Chung is a composer that comes to mind. She has a show that just debuted on NBC called Bound. And her, her score is very atmospheric and tense because it's about uh, a detective who's um, finding missing persons, right? And so it's just this eerie, tense type of soundtrack. And she's great at that, of manipulating her voice and making it sound like a synth pad. Very sparse underscore. It's not that full John Williams or that full Hans Zimmer type approach uh, or Ramin who does Game of Thrones, who's very, you know, big sounding. Um, so it's really the the creative influences where we want to go. And sometimes we'll go with a composer and it doesn't work. And we have to, you know, unfortunately, they always say fire. And I always say, don't say that. Just say you're you're changing directions. But, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we have composers that just don't hit it, you know, and they're not known for uh, horror. Or the other thing, too, to think about is, like, you could have a series that, like, starts off, like, one thing and then becomes something else. Meaning, like, you could have a series like Riverdale that started a certain way and then morphs into something. And so by the time it gets to season three, that composer who did season one is not the right fit. And we need more of a horror composer, right? And we hired a big orchestrator. So um, that I've seen that too, where where a series has evolved and we've had to, to switch. Um, I think one of the best recent things of underscore has been Succession. I forget the composer's name, but that, that person did such a uh, an amazing um, job with that series. If you ever want to like listen to like character appropriate like orchestra like his orchestration influences so much of that show subconsciously of what you're saying it's it's absolutely brilliant awesome awesome thanks do we have any other questions if we don't have any other questions i fred you're busy we understand that we appreciate the hour and a half you've spent with us um wouldn't mind talking to you for the next, you know, three, four hours, but, uh, I know you got to get off and, and do your job too. So, uh, once again, we want to thank you for spending the time with us and, uh, hopefully, uh, we can, you know, let some of the students be in touch with you. Do you mind if, if I share your social media with them so that if they want to be in touch or. Yeah, no, like I can even drop, um, in the chat, I can drop my email here. So we'll let you guys uh, get in contact with Fred if you guys have any other questions. I know sometimes people get a little bit camera shy, don't want to ask a question direct on camera because, um, you know, we're made up of uh, introverts and extroverts. And <laughs> that's the industry that we're in. So yeah, yeah. Um, some people aren't going to be willing to reach out on you know, where it's being documented and might want to reach out to you that way. So appreciate it. Um, thank you guys for joining us and we will see you guys next time with another guest and we'll have some more fun and more questions. Fred, wish you the best in everything that you're doing and I will be in touch with you shortly. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thanks. Appreciate it.